Welcome to Keto Life Support, where we make your keto life sustainable, fun, and low stress. I'm Kim Howerton, and I'll be coming to you weekly with some of my keto besties to bring you the practical, real-world keto advice that you need. Quick disclaimer, I am not a doctor, and even if we do have a doctor in the house from time to time, he or she is not your doctor, and nothing we say on this show should be taken as medical advice. Always check in with a trusted medical professional about your own personal medical concerns. Hello, and welcome to Keto Life Support. This is Kim Howerton, and this is episode number 130. And on today's episode, you're getting a rebroadcast, actually, of a live that I did with Dr. Ken Berry. Dr. Berry is the co-author on my new book, Common Sense Labs. And we talked about labs, right? Uh, Wanting to understand more about blood labs and some frequently asked questions. So we go into some of those questions on this podcast and talking about when the book is available. By the way, at the time of this recording, I think we hadn't been updated yet. It is now going to be shipping out at the end of October. Yes, this month. So if you order now, which is early, mid-October, it'll start arriving towards the end of the month, the beginning of the next month. And then from that point forward, it's just going to be a rolling, normal timing of how long it takes to get a book shipped to you. So not a huge delay soon. Those of you who've already bought books in the past, you've gotten an email with an update, but that is the update if you missed that email. So listen in while Dr. Ken Berry and I chat a bit about blood labs while I was visiting him and Nisha and the kiddos right after the Proper Human Diet Summit. Hello. You might note I am not in my house. So I am here. We're getting a special guest on with us in just a moment. So welcome to the live. I'm happy to have you. We are on both YouTube and Facebook. Uh, We will be seeing some questions come in over here on my channel. So if you're not already a follower or subscribed to my channel, please do so. Please hit the subscribe button. Please hit the like button. Please follow. Please whatever. Because I say some things that you might be interested in hearing about sometime, even if I don't have my special guest with me. So I'd love to see you on the regular, but I'm glad to be here. So Debbie Sue, uh, I've been chasing Kim down all afternoon, making Brie with Nisha, then Dr. Brewer's patron now here. Yep, it is a triple Kim day. Indeed it is. Hi, Paula. Well, glad to have you. So glad to have you. Kevin's here with his jokes, and we're going to be having a good time. If you're not, yeah, Christine said she thought she was subscribed, and now she is. So maybe you think you are, but you're not. Platte River Keto said, enjoyed the cooking this afternoon. Loved your talk at the PhD Summit. So this afternoon, I did a live with Nisha, which you can find on Nisha's channel. Nisha loves it. And we made brie with a topping, we call it bacon jam, which I think there is no problem with that. Uh, I think you can't go wrong with bacon, onion, and a little tomato. Very tasty, very, very tasty. So I'm so glad to have you here. For those of you that are new to my channel, I talk about health stuff, I talk about weight loss, I talk about fat loss. So similar things with Ken and we all have different perspectives and different things. I've lost over 100 pounds since I started my keto journey, um, and I talk about sort of personalizing your health journey, allowing uh, yourself to find the right approach for you, trying to kind of just be a real middle-aged woman here in this world that also has some health and body goals and continuing along my own journey, even having lost over 100 pounds wanting to continue to make better and better choices every day. So glad to have you here with me. So let me see what questions have come in thus far. I'm just scrolling back. Dr. Barry and I have co-wrote a book. Uh, That's the good grammar I bring in out here. Common Sense Labs book.com for the link, commonsenselabsbook.com. It is a book about blood labs. So I actually have a copy here. 
and it's got charts, it's got summaries, it's got codes. Some people have been like, wait, you guys have a physical book, but I haven't gotten my book yet. These are mailing out at the end of the month to people that pre-ordered them online. So no, you haven't missed it. It's still on its way to you. And uh, we are glad to have you here with us today. Oh, well, look at that. Hi. Hey, everybody. All right, we're here together. I was just checking to see what was going on. Go6 says, I've been on the keto shy divorce carnivore journey for two years as of September 13th, down 130 pounds, waiting for my labs book. Hey, everybody. It's an honor to get to join you guys on Kim Howerton's channel. All right, let's see. Three what for today with Kim. Somebody's been watching you all day. All day. Uh, Kristen liked my outfit. Thank you. Uh, the pants are from Polo, in case you want to look for oh. them. Polo. They're fancy pants. And she was wearing her fancy pants as we rode around in the gator today. Uh, yes, I was. Not those, but a different pair of fancy pants. Oh, okay. okay. Uh, Michelle says, four years keto, all of a sudden my blood pressure is messing with me. And by messing with you, you mean it's it's fluctuating or going down or going up? What exactly? Yeah, what is, is it, messing with you mean? What exactly is it doing? So what I would recommend is get a blood pressure cuff at home that checks up here, not on the wrist, and sit down twice a day, calm, relax, chill, 15 minutes, check your blood pressure, write it down. That's a true reading. Right, because sometimes people get weird things going on in the doctor's office. And this might be crazy, but... If you get a new doctor and they have a new machine mm -hmm. and there's a new protocol, mm -hmm. can you see crazy numbers all of a sudden that don't really mean something? Oh, definitely. Yeah. And if, if a doctor's office doesn't have their machines calibrated and tested every so often, that's something a doctor should do. But doctors are busy in their own clinic. They're busy getting toilet paper for the bathroom and not calibrating and recalibrating their blood pressure machine, their sphygmomanometer. And so sometimes you'll get kooky readings, but just check it at home. That's the that's an actual real blood pressure that matters. And I think if you start to do that twice a day, you'll see that your average blood pressure is still fine. And that's what counts. Right. Isn't it true that like the way that a lot of doctor's offices test your blood pressure, how they have you sit or how your position is not the way you're supposed to test blood pressure? Yeah, so all the research defining what is a good blood pressure uh, and do you have high blood pressure was done by the protocol that I just described. Mm -hmm. Sit down in a quiet dark room actually for 15 minutes, not being messed with, not being prodded and poked and asked questions, but quiet and dark for 15 minutes and then check your blood pressure with a calibrated sphygmomanometer. That's a real blood pressure reading. So if your doctor, if they rush you from the waiting room back to the hall, sit you down, check your temperature, ask you 20 questions and check your blood pressure right then. Well, and weigh you first. Uh, well, the first they weigh you. That's right. Yep. Yeah. And so then you're like, yeah, your blood pressure is high. That's not a real reading. That's not the way it's supposed to be done. But unfortunately, many doctor's offices are set up in such mm -hmm. a way and they have to have patient turnover to the extent that they can't let you sit quietly for 15 minutes and then check your blood pressure. So if it's high at the doctor's office, a good thing to do is say, look, go ahead and put me in a room. And while I'm waiting for the doctor, then can you come in and check it again in about 15 minutes? And that way it's not taking up their vital station because that's a station that you go around. They'll come in and recheck it. And very often it's down back to normal at that point. Yeah. Okay. Looking, oh, Debbie Sue is looking forward to the holiday cookbook. Me too. My daughter is a newbie to Keto. I sent her the live link and she watched today. I am nice. so happy to hear that. Sosha says, my cousin's doctor told her she shouldn't eat keto or fat or to heal her fatty liver. Since I've been learning from you all about how fructose and carbs are the main carb yeah. source of this. Maybe share a couple of my YouTube videos about fatty liver with uh, your cousin's doctor. Absolutely. Oops. Sorry, guys. The... The thread is a little jumpy right now, so if I missed your question, I apologize. Um, yes, the labs book is still available at commonsenselabsbook.com. Commonsenselabsbook.com. Yep. Aw, Terry, thank you so much. I agree with Terry, 100%. Thank you. Well, Terry is the best, too. She's done so great. Terry, what, 170 pounds? Oh, something like wow. that? Yeah, something like that. Nice. Yeah. Yeah. All right. Let's see. Um, tell us why we need this book. Let's talk about the book a little bit. Yeah. More. Let's talk about the book. Did you show it? I showed it. I okay. did. But we so, can show it again. Uh, so 
so many doctors and you if you're on any of the keto facebook pages if you see the comments in my youtube videos you know that many doctors have no idea for example what the hell a fasting insulin or a C-peptide means. They don't know what it means, much less that. So if you don't know what something means, then you're sure not going to order it right. on a patient. Right. And so a patient could literally have prediabetes for 10 years and have a normal fasting blood sugar. Oh, yeah. And even have a normal A1C. But you're prediabetic because you're hyperinsulinemic. And the only way to know that is to check these labs. And so... Part of the, the reason for this book is to educate you guys. But another part of this is so when your doctor says, well, what the hell you want to see that? I wouldn't even know what to do with that. You can be like, well, doctor, actually, and turn to page 12 and say, this is what a CPEP tells you, doctor. Doesn't that sound important? I would like to know if I'm hyperinsulinemic or not. Wouldn't you like to know that about me? Because that increases my risk of metabolic syndrome, hypertension, type 2 diabetes, heart attack, and stroke if I'm hyperinsulinemic. So that sounds important. Shouldn't I know that? Yeah, also my risk of getting PCOS, also my risk of having migraines. I mean, literally with hyperinsulinemia, there's a list a mile long of, of medical conditions that increases your risk of, but you've got to order the test. And then a lot of doctors say, well, your insurance is not going to pay for that. Well, in many cases, the reason your insurance is not going to pay for it is because the doctor didn't code for it properly. Right. We actually include the ICD-10 codes in the book. So when your doctor says, well, your insurance is not going to pay for that, you can be like, well, actually, doctor, here's a list of codes that you can put in. I'm going to do your job for you. And then insurance will probably pay for it or at least pay for some of it. Right. Also, we talk about optimal lab ranges. Right. Not just reference ranges. Right. So an A1C of 5.6 is normal. And that's good. Mm -hmm. But a 5.3 is better. Does that make sense? And so some labs are like that. Other labs, just being normal is fine. That's all you have to worry about. Other labs, you don't want to just be in the normal range. You want to be optimal. And that's this range, not this range. Right. Absolutely. We, we cover all that and more. We do. We talk about all of that and more. Yeah. It's, you know, Carolina? Yes. Yeah. Yes. When she, before she went keto, this is a good friend, Carolina. She is a wonderful coach as well. Before she went keto, do you know what her fasting insulin was? What was it? 70. Now, if her doctor didn't know what a fasting insulin was and they hadn't checked that, mm -hmm. she would have no idea that yeah, she was you know that what her metabolically A1C ill. Was? It was normal, wasn't it? 5.0. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And that's the thing. And But she was very obese. Very obese. Some people, can they'll become very overweight. Mm -hmm. Their A1C will stay normal, but their insulin is sky high. Mm -hmm. When you fix that insulin by fixing your diet... Then your insulin comes back down to normal. You lose the weight. And if you had developed prediabetes or type 2 diabetes, that goes away. But that knowing that her her fasting insulin was high, that's the whole key to discovering her basically effectively hidden right. metabolic syndrome. Right. Yeah. And so a lot of doctors, they are just not testing as much as they need to test. That's right. Yeah, absolutely. Debbie Sue, my daughter started keto three weeks ago, no weight loss yet. So the first thing I would say is I wouldn't even try for weight loss. I mean, if it happens naturally, mm -hmm. great. Yep. But I wouldn't even try for weight loss until she's been keto for at least a month or two. The way of eating has become easy. The food choices have become relatively easy. I know it's frustrating because a lot of us started keto, lose weight, at least one of the major things we wanted. Yeah. But you stay with it once you're like, okay, I know what I'm doing now. Then you troubleshoot to try and fix yeah. and the I'm, details. I, I'm sure that's your daughter's primary motivation right. to lose weight. And maybe perhaps your primary motivation for your daughter is to help her lose some weight. Mm -hmm. But realize this is a proper human diet. This is going to improve her health in hundreds of ways. Mm -hmm. Eventually, the if she's carrying excess body fat, it'll come off. That'll happen. That's going to happen. But don't try not to let that be your primary motivation for doing this. And then also three weeks is not a long time. Three weeks, you're still getting keto adapted, probably going through some carbohydrate withdrawals. It's going to take a while. Be patient. Yeah. Lynn asked about what damage chronically high insulin does. You know, there's a good book that I would recommend. Yep. Professor Ben Bickman wrote mm -hmm. an excellent book called Why We Get Sick. And he breaks this down in detail. 
And basically every one of my YouTube videos about a specific condition, whether it's keratosis pilaris, acne, PCOS, migraines, all of them that are about a condition, it's hyperinsulinemia is the cause. And the reason I'm able to make those videos with, with authority and not be afraid, like maybe I'm wrong about this, is yeah. because when you look in the literature, mm -hmm. there's reams of data showing, oh my God, migraine is so intimately related with hyperinsulinemia. Oh, PCOS basically is, you might as well call it, it hyperinsulinemia. Mm -hmm. uh, metabolic syndrome, hypertension. Certain types of cancers. All, many types of cancers. All these things are just hyperinsulinemia. And so insulin is a hormone, right? And it basically adjusts all of your other hormones. And so a lot of people will yell at me and be like, no, PCOS is about high testosterone and, and DHEA. And I'm like, well, yes, indirectly. But what's causing your testosterone and DHEA to be off? It's the hyperinsulinemia. And when you fix that by fixing your diet, that goes back to normal and allows your other hormones to go back to normal as well. All right. Kevin says keto three years, major health issues have been fixed, had high hypertension. Hypertension. And prediabetes, fatty liver, having issues with dizziness lately. What might that so be? So in a, a new onset dizziness in a 55 year old, that necessitates a trip to your doctor. Okay. okay. That, there could be serious things causing that. But more than likely, you're just not getting enough salt, enough electrolytes. You might be portion controlling a little bit. Uh, make sure you're getting plenty of salt, plenty of electrolytes. If you don't use uh, keto chows, daily mineral drops, get some of those. Could be a mineral deficiency. Uh, but Rule out anything. It, yes, you need, you, this needs to be ruled out to make sure there's nothing else going on. Right. Okay. Do you know what they mean? Can you weigh in on the 80-20 protocol? Do you know what that is? Yeah, so this is a thing Kelly Hogan has been doing with a few other carnivores where they're eating a, a fat to protein ratio of 80-20. Oh, okay. And for some people... Is that 8%? 80% mm -hmm, uh -huh. protein to 20%. I Which mean, is basically fats. like a 2 to 1. A 2 to 1, that's yeah. right. That's exactly what it is, yeah. But the calories come up to 80-20. Right. And so a lot of people feel better with mm -hmm. this, this, kind of, this version of carnivore. It's basically a high-fat carnivore. Mm -hmm. And I think most people, whether they're eating keto, ketovore, or carnivore, they need to eat a one-to-one -one or two-to-one ratio of fat to protein. And some people do really, really well on a higher protein approach. Some people do better on a higher fat approach. <clears throat> uh, Siobhan Huggins, yep. very much in the high-fat camp. And, and somebody, if you don't already know about her, Siobhan Huggins, she's the co-brain at Own Your Labs. Yep. And she uses a high fat approach. Also, um, Paleo Medicina. Yes. Um, they are Very big advocates fat. of this high fat approach. Yep. And I agree. I agree with that. I do better with high fat. Yep. I think there seems to be a subset of people who do better with uh, high protein, adequate fat. But most people in my experience do better on high fat, adequate protein. I think that there's also a bit about like if you have autoimmune issues, if you have lipedema, if you're yep. if you're have hyperinsulinemia, you know when you're in that sphere of real metabolic distress, uh, I certainly think it's a great option there. I think in a metabolically healthy person, I often find in my clients that they've become metabolically healthy, and this was mine. Then high protein became the thing that was more helpful with weight loss at that point. Mm -hmm. But when we're unhealthy and then we're becoming healthier, we don't stay the same person. And so there might be different phases right. of life that different and, approaches might be good. For. And like you said earlier, getting healthy is the primary. It is the primary goal. It doesn't really matter to me. It's like, I don't want to look good in my coffin. Right. I mean, I would like to, you know. Of course. But, but, but that's not my goal. My goal right. is to not be in a coffin and yes. I'll work on what I look like later yes. because I'll have time if I'm not dead. You like, yes. that's what I do. All right, let's see. Kim, how did you conquer the scale? Okay, I actually went counterintuitive with this one. A little ninja move. Okay. I weighed I like myself, I started weighing myself every day. Ooh. Every day I got on the scale. Ooh. And what happened is I had to talk to myself a lot, but let's say you get on the scale intermittently, like once in a blue moon, once in a while, and you get on the scale and it's up or it's down and you're up and you're down and you're up and you're down and you, what are we? Humans are pattern recognition machines. We want to find the reason. We want to find the pattern. And so one of the things that happens is we think, what did I do yesterday? 
my weight is up from three weeks ago. What did I do yeah. yesterday? Immediately you're like, what did I eat last night? Right. <laughs> and so when I started weighing myself every day, I was like, oh, I'm up two pounds. Oh, I'm down two pounds. I didn't really do anything that differently in the last 24 hours. And it began to make me realize and real see real data that like, oh, I just have a body that's doing body things. And it doesn't really have to do with me being a good person or a bad person or what I ate or that. And I just sort of like burned it out. Yeah. And now I have a very data oriented relationship with the scale. It's just a thing I use to get some data. It's not the boss of me. Yeah, I like that. that anyway, that's so, a, a kind of a an opposite, yeah, a, a contrarian. Right. Some people theory. like, like throw that. the scale out, right? Which is also and you're like, no, I'm going to get on the scale every day. This scale is not the boss of me. I am the boss of it. I love that. It is a yeah. tool. And you guys know any test that you do on the human body has an error rate of plus or minus 10%. Yeah. And then the human body, especially female human bodies, can go up or down in, in water weight three pounds mm -hmm. in, mm -hmm. in a 24 hour period. Mm -hmm. So you might be up three pounds today, down six tomorrow. That's literally that can happen. And mm -hmm. it doesn't mean you've lost one ounce of fat or nope. gained one ounce of fat because all you guys focused on that said so I haven't lost any fat. That's what right. that means. No, right it also now. means you haven't gained an ounce of fat when the scale's up three pounds in one day. And they've actually looked at what is scientifically possible right. in terms of fat gain. So I learned that, right? It's almost impossible to gain more than about 0.2 pounds Makes in a sense, day. Yeah. Even if you just ate from morning until night. Just pulled your chair just, up to the KFC buffet. Right. Now you might be 10 pounds heavier on the scale, but you couldn't have gained even a fraction of a whole pound in one day. Now, if you did that every day, sure. you could certainly, right. but one day. So it's like, hmm, I'm 10 pounds heavier. That's impossible. So it gives you, if you can do it, it's a, it's a high, it's like an advanced yeah. ninja move. Yeah. I wouldn't recommend it for beginners. Not for beginners, right. but if you're able to be like, it's like you break the, the cycle. Mm -hmm. I broke the cycle. I love it. That's that was excellent strategy. Yeah. All right. What is the priority that alcohol, carbs, fat, and ketones have, I think they mean oxidative priority. Yeah, so your liver, mm -hmm. one of its main jobs is to get poison out of your system. And uh, alcohol is poison, my friends. I'm sorry, I hate to tell you that. That's the, the drunk thing? Yeah. That's poisoning. Yeah, you listen to Huberman too. Yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> so uh, Andrew Huberman mm -hmm. has a great podcast and he's a very intelligent gentleman and doctor. And the reason you get intoxicated is because of the acetaldehyde that alcohol is converted to by your liver. It is poisoning your brain. That's why you get drunk. Okay. And so your liver's definitely going to stop ketosis. It's going to stop metabolizing anything else. It's going to get the alcohol out of your body. And that's one of the reasons so the doctors know that if you drink alcohol with a meal, you have a slower transit time, mm -hmm. you, right? Mm -hmm. you, you, and your GI motility slowed down. And that's because your liver has got to get the alcohol out of your system because it's poison. Right. We're in a, ha a house with yeah, real people and real, real dogs. Real, <laughs> it's a real life. <laughs> it also shuts down a lot of other things your liver yes. does. What happens to alcoholics A1C? Alcoholics who drink multiple drinks a day can actually have a falsely low hemoglobin A1C. Any good doctor should know that. So if they see somebody who's living on Cheetos and Ding Dongs, but they still have a beautiful A1C, they should ask them the question, how many drinks a day do you think you have? Mm -hmm. And then a good doctor would know to multiply <laughs> times three for women and times mm -hmm. six for men. Mm -hmm. So if you ask a man, how many beers you drink a day on average, if they're an alcoholic, they're going to say, oh, one or two. And you multiply that times six. So six or seven. And, yeah. So one or two, six packs a day. Mm -hmm. And then for a woman, it's one to three drinks. It's three mm -hmm. drinks mm -hmm. for each one she mm -hmm. admits to. Mm -hmm. And uh, yeah, so... Alcohol is poison. It messes right. everything up. Now, do I have an occasional drink? Yes, I do. Can you have an occasional drink? Yes, you can. But do not ever delude yourself into thinking that it's not It's poison. not a health food. And then the next thing your liver will prioritize is the carbohydrates, right? Because for many of us, too many carbs are a kind of slow poison. And so your liver is going to metabolize that and turn as much of it as it can into fat, burn as much as it can for fuel, and then you might get stuck with a, with a few extra things. And then the, the fat and the protein kind of come in last. Yeah. 
All right, so let's talk. Oh, somebody has ordered, CB has ordered another book to give to their primary care excellent, physician. Excellent, excellent. Now let's talk about that for a second. Sure. You might think, well, I mean, I'm going to do what I know is right, even if my doctor's an idiot, okay? But don't think of it that way. I want you to think of this more circumspectly and more magnanimously. How many patients does your doctor have? Because if they're saying stupid shit to you, guess what? They're saying it to every other patient too. They're telling all of them to eat a plant-based diet and to eat lots of whole grains and to not eat red meat. And so when you give your doctor a copy of something like this, if you adjust the way they believe in human nutrition, physiology, and medicine, you affect every other patient in their practice, which okay. could literally could improve the health of your entire community if this doctor is now suddenly ordering fasting insulins and C-peptides on all his or her patients you just made your entire community a healthier so place. So much better. What do you think in the book? What are the kind of top few tests that you think most people aren't getting? Oh, the vast majority of people. Well, many people are getting just a basic metabolic panel. Right. Right, which looks at electrolytes, blood sugar, and kidney function. So they're not getting their liver checked at all. Mm -hmm. Whereas okay. if they'll order a complete metabolic panel or a comprehensive, that actually checks the liver. Oh, your liver enzymes are high. Oh, you've got fatty liver. Right. And it, fatty liver is just like through the roof now. A huge epidemic. But yeah. if you don't check a, a comprehensive metabolic panel, you don't get any labs at all for the liver. So that's a big one. Big one. The liver is important in case you didn't know. Yes. It's estimated that only 7% of the U.S. population Adult population Seven. Is, is metabolically healthy. Yeah, yeah. They, it, we used to think mm -hmm. it was 12, and they it just updated. It used to be 12, and now it's only 7% 7. of adults. So out of 100 adults, you know, only seven of them have all perfect metabolic markers. So every doctor needs to be checking either a C-peptide or fasting insulin or both so that they can catch hyperinsulinemia early and then say, hey, your insulin is really high. You're going to develop prediabetes and eventually type 2 diabetes or hypertension or PCOS or all the other things that high insulin causes. you got to get that under control. Well, doctor, how do I get that under control? Well, you, you get it under control by eating a lower carbohydrate diet. Mm -hmm. But And so you see how you can just, it's like a cascade of dominoes. First, your doctor's like, shit, all my patients have high, high insulin, but I don't know how to fix that. What do I do? Well, they're going to Google it and maybe one of my YouTube videos will pop up and they'll be like, so keto fixes that? What? And then they're going to start looking and maybe get out one of their old physiology textbooks mm -hmm. and look and go, oh my God, yeah. Too many carbohydrates. Yeah. Insulin. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, oh my God. Everybody, all my patients need to eat keto. That's literally how I discovered this. Right. And almost every doctor has a story like that, right? It's either somebody brought in the Atkins book and then they said, I said, what are you doing? And they said, I'm doing this. And the doctor was like, oh, I don't think that's a good idea. But they yep. kind of kept having people coming in and saying, I'm doing this. And it seems to be working. Yes. So when you wake your doctor up to the hidden metabolic health epidemic that's right under their nose that they're currently blind to because they're not ordering these tests, you improve the health of every neighbor that sees that doctor. All right. Idaho Jesse says, I have diabetes, been controlling my numbers with diet down to an average blood sugar of 130s. I'm currently fasting for 36 hours so far, but today my blood sugar has bounced up to the 170s. What, yeah. Is that something you see? Yeah, that happens. Uh, it, there's a hundred different reasons why it may have Oops. bumped up to 170. We're not going to worry about just one blood sugar reading. We're going to look for patterns mm -hmm. and trends. Mm -hmm. And so you're going to check your blood sugar two or three times a day and write that down. And you're going to watch what's the trend over the next week or two right. or five. You're not going to go, oh, my God, if I had one high blood sugar. Oh, my God. That's meaningless. That's just like one high blood pressure. That doesn't right. really mean right. anything bad right. at all. It could have to do with sleep. It could, Yeah. A hundred different things. Yes, but after exactly. a 36 hour fast, do you yeah. find there's anything that happens over long fasting? That can yeah, it's very common for people as they fast past really 18 hours for their, them to start noticing the blood sugar elevation. OK, because your red blood cells have to have sugar. And after that long of a fast, you're starting to deplete your glycogen stores. And so your body ramps up something called gluconeogenesis. And this starts to make red blood cells the glucose that they need because they don't have mitochondria. Mm -hmm. They have to have glucose and mm -hmm. your liver's happy to make that for them if they need it. Another way to notice a spike like this, that's not 
pathological. It's not dangerous. Is if you work out while you're fasting, mm -hmm. your blood sugar is going to spike up. You're right. like, oh God, that must be right. unhealthy right. to work out while you're fasted. No, that's normal. That's a physiological blood sugar elevation. Your body needed that. Now, if you eat some Twinkies mm -hmm. and your blood sugar spikes, that's a pathological hyperglycemic episode. You okay. cause that by eating too many carbs. Melanie says clean carnivore for nine weeks. So new to clean carnivore. Fasting, blood sugar in the AM well over 100. Gained 35 pounds and swelling from hips to toes. This is someone I'd probably send to the doctor. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. You, there's something else going on here. Uh, clean carnivore doesn't do that. Right. Uh, you probably need to see your doctor for a good kidney, liver, and heart workup. You definitely didn't gain that much fat mm -hmm. in that length of time. Mm -hmm. uh, definitely not on a carnivore And that diet. whole lower body mm -hmm. swelling is a... Yeah, you're holding yeah. fluid from... There's probably some failure going on somewhere. Thank you, Nisha Berry. Thank you. Uh, Terry asked your thoughts on Sam E. Do you, is that a supplement? A waste of money. Terry. A waste of money, Terry. Yeah. Buy meat. Eat your meat. Buy good quality eggs and meat. That's what you need. All right. Uh, people are looking for, oh, PhD got rid of Debbie Sue's fatty liver. 100%. Oh, Terry says she's seven pounds away from 170 pound loss. Seven till gold. Seven till gold. Nice. Um, you know that's going to take a long time to get rid of that seven. It's not fair, but yeah, that's how yeah, it is. It's like that'll be the slowest seven that ever happened, but there you go. All right, let's check. Can donating blood lower iron? Yeah, temporarily. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. But if your diet is rich in iron-rich foods, you're going to build that right back up right. within just a, a day or two or three. It doesn't take long. So there's a condition. Is it beta? No, that's something else. The beta thalassemia, that's something else. What is the condition that people can have where they have too high in iron and they have to have their blood Hemochromatosis. Blood? Hemochromatosis. Yeah, yeah, that's what yeah. I'm thinking. And about. that's a very rare condition. Mm -hmm. But a lot of doctors, so a lot of doctors, there's another thing we talk about. A lot of doctors think that a high ferritin level mm -hmm. absolutely means you have iron overload because ferritin can be related to iron metabolism along with a hundred other things it can be related mm -hmm, to. Mm -hmm. But they just remember ferritin's related to iron somehow. This person's eating carnivore, right. therefore they must have iron overload. They right. must have hemochromatosis. Right. Nothing could be further from the truth. So having a book like this, you can look up ferritin and go, no, actually the lots of things. other things. It's an acute phase reactant. Right. In the middle of an infection, right. your ferritin level will elevate. Mm -hmm. But if a doctor doesn't know that and they happen to check it while you have inflammation or an infection, Oh my God, you've got iron overload. No, you don't. Right. Alan and Sue say, I just, I don't know if it's Alan or Sue, but we'll go with that. I just had a hip replacement surgery a week ago. Will eating keto or carnivore help me heal faster? Friends keep bringing over non-keto casseroles. <laughs> yeah. Any suggestions on yeah, healing feed, faster? Feed the casseroles to your dogs. The next friend that comes over, give, give them yes. the last casserole. Give the casserole. And then eat all the meat. You want all the meat, all of because you are meat, right? And so you need all the building blocks to rebuild and heal that meat as quickly as you can. You're going to get that from meat. You're going to get it maybe from liver once a week. Mm -hmm. You can have some veg. You can have some berries and some nuts. Nisha. If she only has two children and 12 animals in there. Ken Berry. <laughs> um, yeah. Yeah. And the other thing is, I would say, I would maybe say this person might eat like chicken wings and things that have like meat that has a high collagen content yes. as well. Sardines with the bones mm -hmm. in, another great source. Yeah, absolutely. All right. Cindy says, I'm 63, five foot one, 108 pounds. It's amazing. Three years keto-ish. Why won't my A1C go lower than 5.6? Now, Cindy, an A1C of 5.6 is pretty good. Normal. Normal. That is normal. You win, okay? Now, if we can get it to go down lower, then that'd be fine with me. What was her diet, did she say? She said keto-ish. Yeah, so that's why it won't go lower than five, six, is your keto-ish. So if you tighten that up to true 20 total grams of carbohydrate keto a day, lots of fatty meat, lots of eggs with the yolk, and less than 20 total grams a day, it'll come down to five, five, or five, four. But keto-ish is going to get you a normal-ish A1C. Right. Karen asks, is a 5.7 A1C horrible? No, it's one-tenth of a point above normal. You have just dipped your toe into the pre-diabetes pool. All you need to do is cut the carbohydrates. If you lowered your total carb intake by 30 or 40 carbs a day, uh, that'll be back to normal in no time. So we talk about a basic lipid panel in the book, right? Yes. So 
What is in a basic lipid panel? So a basic lipid panel is total cholesterol, HDL cholesterol, LDL cholesterol, and triglycerides. And then they might include a few ratios in that as well, depending, which are not, cal they're calculated, they're not measured. But uh, an HDL of 32 is, that's too low. As a female, you want that to be above really 50. And you're going to do that. You're going to get that up by eating more fatty red meats and by lifting heavy things. That's how you're going to yeah. do that. Somebody asked about the codes if they're just oh, in the U.S. Yeah. Uh, ICD-10 codes, that actually stands for International Classification of Diseases. And so some countries are on a different version of ICD. Some are on ICD-9. Some are on mm -hmm. ICD-11 already. Mm -hmm. These are ICD-10 codes, which we use in the, in the U.S. And most other countries are typically using ICD-10 codes right now. That's the codes we have. Right. And if you're asking about like the lab numbers, we do use the U.S. Some the results. the results in terms of like what the ranges should be. The units are in the U.S. units. However, we're going to add an addendum for U.K., Canada, uh, Europe. Yeah, I think I covered. Anyway, um, and so we will be adding that and we'll be giving you guys a link in the future. It's not in the current book. If you want the book now, if you want to read it now, then you can just go into a search engine and get all those conversions. But you do have to do that work. But we are going to add that and we'll give it to everybody that has bought the book already. Tingling face and body during a fast. Get your calcium checked by your doctor, Trevor. All right. Can keto help with Parkinson's? Oh, yeah. Parkinson's, Huntington's. Uh, Alzheimer's, all of these things, the progression is going to slow down and the severity is going to decrease when you're eating a proper human diet. Okay. Oh, it looks like Kelly Hogan released a new yep. video today. All right. Bryn mentioned freezing. I'm always cold. No other symptoms been like this much in my adulthood. I found that daily minerals and four drops of iodine does help, but not much. I guess my question, Bryn, or Brianne, sorry, would be, have you had a full appropriate thyroid panel done. Yeah. And that's one of the things we list in the book is the full thyroid panel. What all does that entail? Because the average doctor is going to check just the TSH. A little better than average doctor is going to check a TSH and a free T4. And that's it. And you could have a severe Hashimoto's or a severe reverse T3 problem. You will not know. And your doctor will not know unless they check all of the tests. I'm glad that you're supplementing with iodine and I, I suspected that would help you said it did but not quite enough I'm afraid that even though you're getting adequate iodine you still have an undiagnosed thyroid condition the fact that adding iodine helped yep. is a little bit uh yep. makes my eyebrows go up a little bit yep. that is a thyroid <clears throat> issue because if you don't have high, if you don't have a thyroid problem and you add more iodine would that make a change? If you were depleted enough, you can have basically effective hypothyroidism. Mm, and that would, but that would have fixed it. That so if the symptoms continue, right. okay. Yes, yes. Um, Linda says, can you have a fasting insulin of 14 if you have hyperinsulinemia? I would say that that would be a number I would think of as hyperinsulinemia. Yeah, so that's one thing we cover in the book is what's normal because most labs will tell you that a fasting insulin under 25 is normal. And it is. That is the official normal mm -hmm. range, but that's not optimal. Mm -hmm. And that's what we talk about in Common Sense Labs is you want a fasting insulin definitely under 10 mm -hmm. and probably even lower than that. Mm -hmm. That's that's where you're going to enjoy your best metabolic health. It's right. when you've got that insulin well under 14 and, and hopefully under 10. You want it not only in the normal range, you want it in the optimal range. Right. And that's a big deal is there are these reference ranges. We have a whole section on this in the book. There are these reference ranges that doctors are given by the lab company, but the reference ranges are built mostly about what is common, right? The reference range is the common range. Mm -hmm. But if we know that only 7% of the population is actually <clears throat> metabolically healthy, does common mean good? Right. Nope. And that's, you explained it perfectly. They just take a random sample of a hundred people and they check the fasting insulin. And then they use the, the curve that she's got in the book. 95% is normal. Then there's 5% on the upper and lower end that's abnormal. But what if everybody in that hundred people were metabolically sick? And that's exactly what you see when you look at the fasting insulin normal range. They should call it the average range because normal implies good. Right. 
but it ain't good. It is average, though. That's the average insulin. Yes, that's true. So at some point, doctors stop being concerned with what's optimal. What's the optimal insulin mm-hmm. level or the optimal TSH or the optimal? They just want you to be like uh, Garrison Keillor says, all the kids in town are above average. It's, it's like, <laughs> how's that possible? Mm-hmm. They just want you to be average. If you're in the middle of the pack, they're happy with that. Right. I'm not happy with that for you. I want you to be in your optimal zone on each and every one of your lab tests. Mm-hmm. All right. I'm just looking for a little, few little more here. Lisa says, I found out my A1C at six. My fasting blood sugar, sugar was 108. Isn't 108 a good number? 108 is a bit high for a fasting blood sugar, is it not? Yeah. And now if that's just a one-time reading 108, it really doesn't tell you anything. But does, it, it aligns with six. It does. That's yeah. right. Yeah, but it, but that doesn't have to be the case. You mm-hmm. could have an A1C of five and have a 108, or you could have an A1C of 14 and have a 108. Mm-hmm. That's why you've got to check the A1C. Every doctor knows to check your uh, blood sugar, but mm-hmm. many docs, you would think everybody checks A1Cs. Uh-uh. Mm-hmm. No, no, unless you have a family history of diabetes or they think you have diabetes, they won't check your A1C. And so you can have this 108, and your doc says, eh, it's not too bad. We'll check it again next year. Uh, your A1C six, you're pre-diabetic. Right. Yeah. And, and we, your doctor would have missed that had they not checked the A1C. Right. So, and we go over this with the charts here in the book about what your A1C aligns with in terms of being optimal and out of range. And so with a A1C of six, you're in that pre-diabetic heading towards diabetic right. range. Damage is being done yeah. right now yeah. at an A1C of six. And that's why I'm going to tell you, Lisa Farner, uh-huh. to lower your daily carbohydrate intake. You've got to get that A1C back down to 5.6 or lower. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. All right. Let's see. Oh, there's a lot of a little comments. I don't know what's the worst kind of specialist. Somebody said, don't you think oh. urologists are the worst? I don't oh. know. It depends on what exactly you're talking well, about. Well, if you don't have a problem in urology, then it's not as big a deal. But I have a, I now I don't want to say anything horrible about endocrinologists, but there are a lot of troublesome endocrinologists. Yes, I agree. I agree. Yeah, yeah. If I had to pick a specialist that, that are the most worthless, with the potential to be the most awesome but, mm-hmm. the, but they suck, mm-hmm. would be endocrinologists, yeah. Mm-hmm. Like, they have the education. If they understood what's in this book, mm-hmm. they could help so many people. So many people. Because endocrine, so if you guys don't know, endocrinologist, endocrine is your hormone system. So an endocrinologist is specifically a hormone doctor, right? right. All of these things are hormone related. They could be the game changer for us all. They should be leading this. Right. Not, not a family doctor from right. Tennessee. Right. Yeah. Right. So question from Ashley about type 1 diabetics an EGFR of 50, protein in urine, GFR went down, blood pressure went up on Los, I can't say that, Losartan. Yeah, which is an ARB. Do you think beef, butter, bacon, and eggs is okay for me? Actually, 100% it's okay for you. You've got probably stage one chronic kidney disease from your years of uncontrolled type one diabetes. And that's okay. Okay. You're like, shit, I don't want that. But that's okay. Because when you start beef, butter, bacon, and eggs, you as a type one on Kim Howerton's channel, you're going to know my, my insulin need is going to drop quickly when I get on triple B and E. Okay. And so you're going to hopefully have a CGM. So you can watch minute by minute what your blood sugar is doing. And you're going to lower your insulin usage as you lower your carbohydrates. And I would take a month to convert from whatever you're doing now to beef, butter, bacon, and eggs. Mm -hmm. Slowly convert to a month. So it gives you some time to lower the insulin. But you'll be using 80 or 90% less insulin. And you'll have effectively zero hypos Mm -hmm. if you do this slowly. Mm -hmm. And not blind. You've got a CGM, so you're watching what's going on. And once you're on beef, butter, bacon, and eggs, you'll be using 90% less insulin. And Dr. Bernstein calls it the law of small numbers. If you're eating lots of carbs and injecting lots of insulin, then your risk of having a hypoglycemic episode skyrockets because there's too many variables. But if you're eating super low carb and using very low amounts of insulin, it's almost impossible at a certain point to have a hypoglycemic episode because you're just not going to miscalculate because you're dealing with smaller numbers. Would you recommend that Ashley get that book? Oh, yes. Uh, the the di- Diabetes, Diabetes Solution, Solution by uh, Dr. Bernstein. Every type 1 diabetic, when they're diagnosed in the hospital, they should be given a copy of that mm-hmm. book or an audible if they have ADHD. All right. That, yeah, definitely. Good. That is Common Sense Labs book. 
lab.com is where you can get the labs book. All right, let's, oh, people have saved money not buying crap food and they can use it at own your labs to yeah. buy blood tests. So yep. you can, so if your doctor won't order a lot of these tests in almost every state in the United States, not every state, and I'm sorry, people overseas, not so much you guys, but in 45 of the 50 US states, you can use a service to order your own blood labs. Absolutely. And they're not usually actually as expensive as you might think they are. Yes. So Susie says, oh, so after an 18 hour fast, a 111 blood glucose is not a problem? No. Because the dawn phenomenon yes. is normal. That's normal. Yeah, yeah, that's totally normal. But now you're going to follow up with an A1C just to make sure that your average blood sugar is where it needs to be. Rochelle, oh, Rochelle brings up a fabulous point. My triglycerides were 186 after getting blood work four hours after eating a big fatty carnivore meal. Yep. We always have to take blood work fasting. Yes, in this book, we actually talk about that more and more doctors are saying, meh, yeah. it doesn't matter. But And I think the big reason is, is they don't care what your triglycerides are. Right. All they care about is your LDL cholesterol. Mm -hmm. That's mm -hmm. what they're looking at. Not knowing, either forgetting or not never learning that high triglycerides are a huge risk factor for heart attack and stroke, mm -hmm. right? And a lot of docs have forgotten that if you eat, it's going to raise your blood sugar. Even if you eat a carnivore meal, your blood sugar might go up a little or it might go down a little. Well, it's going to affect it. And triglycerides actually go up more in a non-fasted state yes. from fat than sometimes even carbohydrates. Yes. Whereas chronic high right, is right. that's and temporary high triglycerides are meaningless. Right. That doesn't mean anything bad. Right. But if your triglycerides are 187 all day every day because mm -hmm. you're eating too many carbohydrates, that's meaningful. Mm -hmm. You've got to fast for 12 to 14 hours before you have any blood work checked. And if your doctor says, no, you don't have to fast, then your doctor doesn't know what the hell he or she's talking about because they're just looking at your LDL cholesterol. Yeah. L and B says my TSH, which stands for thyroid stimulating hormone, is very low, but T3 and T4 is normal. Am I over medicated? Good question. It depends. How are your symptoms, L and B? If your symptoms are like, no, I feel great, then you're probably on the perfect dose for you. If you're jittery and antsy and your heart rate's 120 and you can't sleep and you're just like this, then you may be on too much medication. One thing that we mentioned in the book and that I have noticed, I'm not a doctor, by the way, he is, but I am not. What I've noticed in myself and many people I know is when you are on medication, you might feel that you're best when your TSH is actually pretty low. Yes. Because I think... There's a different effect on TSH when you're medicated versus yes. when you're not medicated. Absolutely. Yeah. So how you feel is central. So let's see. My last A1C in 2017 was 4.9. haven't had another one, and my sister is a type 1 diabetic. All right. Well, 4.9 is a great yep. A1C. Oh, here we go, Chris. Thank you, Chris, for the super chat. My husband lost 60 pounds ketovore over a year. However, his anxiety has come back. It stopped when he ate carbs. After three weeks keto bore again, it came back. What is going on? Hmm. Either carbohydrate withdrawal, right? Yeah, which can mimic anxiety perfectly, mm -hmm. or he may be a, a subset of the human population that needs to eat a few actual real whole food carbs. Mm -hmm. I doubt it, but it's possible. And I will say, that if you are somebody that has gotten metabolically healthy, lost 60 pounds, right? You're now metabolically healthy. It might be true that your body can handle a little bit of carbohydrate, but I would want you to choose. And, and this is what I do. I choose whole food carbohydrates, fruits and vegetables, mostly vegetables rather than anything processed. Yeah. All right. Let's see. Um, people can't wait to get their book. Great. What's the name of the book? commonsenselabsbook.com is where you can go and get it. Yeah, Linda feels mm -hmm. best when the TSH is under one. Many, many people who are on thyroid replacement hormone mm -hmm. report, I feel perfect if it's just under one or uh, between 0.5 and one. Mm -hmm. My doc will only test TSH. What does it mean if one year later it's higher by 0.205 points? We don't know, Sharon. 
Right. But it does mean your doctor is currently ignorant about the proper treatment, the diagnosis and treatment of thyroid conditions. Mm -hmm. uh, it doesn't mean your doctor's bad. It doesn't mean your doctor's a lost cause. It just means they're currently ignorant. And you can help to teach your doctor by taking them a copy of this book and saying, Doctor, why do these people recommend this panel of thyroid labs instead of just checking only the TSH? And then you can ask questions like, well, if I had a problem converting T4 to T3, could you detect that by just checking a TSH? Well, now, doctor, if I had Hashimoto's thyroiditis, would that show up if you just checked a TSH? And when you start asking questions like that, typically most doctors know you you know more than you should know, and they're, they'll get the lab thing out and just say, okay, what do you want me to order? Just tell right. me. I'll right. write it down. It is more beneficial for them to get you out of their hair, yes. to get your questions done yeah. with, than to have to explain them to you. Many doctors just abhor a well-informed, smart, question-asking patient. That was always my favorite patient. Mm. It's like, oh, you actually give a shit about mm -hmm. your health. That's mm -hmm. good. We can be partners. I can help you. But if a doctor gets offended that you're asking intelligent, informed questions, that might be a red flag, my friend. Yep. Platte River Keto says, I just wanted to say thank you to Kim and Dr. Bear for your help on my keto journey. I am down 150 points. <laughs> nice. Wife is down 30. I gave my, do my dad lies my doctor told me, and he's now dabbling in Wonderful. keto. Wonderful. Pay it forward. That's how you do it. Lisa asked, can a person wean off of levothyroxine? So that's a thyroid med. Right? That's right. That's fake T4. And so you can wean off that and onto one of the desiccated thyroid like Nature or Armor, WP, NP. But most people, if they have true hypothyroidism, they're going to always need some form of thyroid hormone replacement. I'd much prefer you be on a real thyroid hormone replacement than fake T4. Yeah, and I will also say one thing, I think a lot of us really, I don't love taking medication, right? But not all conditions are always going to be reversed once the damage is done. That's right. And it's sort of, so if you can fix the cause, like if you had an autoimmune disease and downstream you were ending up having your thyroid affected, if you fix that original cause, um, if you were very malnourished and you become properly nourished, that might mean you could get off the meds because you fix the root cause. Yep. But for so many of us, the root cause is either unknown or unfixable. Or the thyroid's been getting damaged for decades right. and right. It's, you've beat it up enough, it can never recover. Yeah, and so don't feel bad. I love my thyroid medicine because my thyroid medicine makes me not want to die. And you think, oh, my doctor's never gonna change. Christine said, my doctor didn't want to order the full thyroid panel to begin with, but now she orders them no problem. Yeah. Doctors are educable. Mm-hmm. So even though it may seem like they're not. And if they hear it enough times. Yes. If they hear it yes. enough times, it's important. It is funny. I used to have a doctor that had a computer right in front of them. And I would go in and I would see them. And they would sit down at their desk with their computer. Because I would ask them questions and then say, hold on, let me look that up. Like with me sitting right there. Now, yep. they had some other like higher end than just Google. They were like Dr. Yep. Google. Yep. Yep. Right. They were looking because of but she's like, we can't remember everything. That's right. We got to look that's stuff up. That's an honest up. doctor. Yeah. Yeah. That's yeah. totally true. Yeah. Uh, very often in between patients, I would go and be like, I can't remember exactly. Let me look that up. And I would be, uh, there's a thing called MD consult. That's got like 80 different medical textbooks and then access to 4,000 medical journals. Mm -hmm. And I had a subscription to that. So I mm -hmm. can go and literally it's open book. Mm -hmm. That's why we call it practice. And so mm -hmm. I would go look it up to verify that I remembered what I was talking about. But many doctors don't feel comfortable doing that. And that's dumb. It's dumb. It's dumb. 100% dumb. dumb. Yeah. Yeah. So um, Michelle asked in the book, do you guys advise what are good numbers? Yes. Yes, actually, in the back of the book, very handy dandy little charts where we mention what the reference range is. The normal range. The, the average common range. range yeah. Right? And then what's the optimal range? Optimal range. Right. right. And sometimes they're the same, but yeah. oftentimes they're different. That's right. So, all right, we're going to wrap it up in a second here. Let's see. Is Kim coming to Kita Palooza? I am not, Aww. but Amy Berger will be there. And funnily oh, enough, they're twins. People confuse us for each other. So just pretend I'm there, but my name is Amy. Yes. All right. Yes. So um, let's see. Oh, 
when my doctor refused to add the full thyroid test, I asked for a referral to an endocrinologist and they did. So nice. just ask well for a played. referral. Yeah. Well played. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. All right. Let's see if we got a good wrap up question before we go. Alan says, do you recommend, do you suggest carnivore or keto? Well, that is a great question. Yes. Yes. Yeah. Pick the one that sounds the most delicious to you. If you could eat meat and eggs the rest of your life and never miss a vegetable, then carnivore. If you're like, no, I want, a, I want some veg and maybe some nuts and berries occasionally, then keto. Mm -hmm. Pick the one that you're like, I could eat that way for the rest of my life and stick to it. Do you, do you agree with this? That if somebody has more like ongoing health problems, autoimmune concerns, yeah. kidney stones, gut dysbiosis, like they're sicker, yeah. right? They would probably benefit from at least trying carnivore. Yes. If they could stick to it. Yeah. But, but, and so you have to know yourself. Can right. I really stick to that? If right. you're going to be like, I'll oh, screw that up in a week and I'll say to hell with it. Mm -hmm. then don't do that. Just right. start with keto and then you can slowly transition into carnivore. But yes, there are many conditions yeah. where carnivore is the way. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. you, you, keto will might help it, but mm -hmm. carnivore is going to fix it. Yeah. Yes. And so, and then I also always like to give hope that even sometimes just a period of carnivore yes, before yes. going back to keto can be 90 beneficial. days of beef, butter, bacon, and eggs mm -hmm. will answer so many questions mm -hmm. and reverse so many chronic conditions. Mm -hmm. It might become my official recommendation at some point mm -hmm. that mm -hmm. like you just need to suck it up and do 90 days mm -hmm. of beef, butter, bacon, and eggs. And then you can choose carnivore, right. keto, keto, or whatever. Jacques has asked, um, can we swap back and forth between keto and carnivore? Yep. I would say, yeah. 100%. I would yes. say, yeah, there's no yep. problem yep. there. Yep. There's many reasons why you might and why you could. I can't think of a single reason why you should not. All right. And the last question, total or net? Total. total. There you Always go. Total, total. Now, total. if you own a keto cookie company and you're trying to make money, then you should count net carbs on the package. But if you are a human who's trying to improve your health and not oh, be with a body with a real body yeah and you're trying to not be fooled by mm -hmm. snack cake makers then you're going to count total carbs mm -hmm. yeah. mm -hmm. so here's the deal some of us have a higher carb tolerance i know you know this is a little yep. like i would rather know what my real carb tolerance is yep. as in my total total carb tolerance mm -hmm. and then work to that then say in a magic reverse universe where some things count and some things don't, what is my carb tolerance? Exactly. Right? Does that make sense? Yeah, totally. And you've actually done the experiment. Before. I have. You could stay under 20 net grams of carbs a right? day, but what was your total carb? I, I once did an experiment because I am this person. I was like, what's the most total carbs I could fit in 20 net carbs? I got over 50. I got over 50. And a lot of people falsely believe mm -hmm. that fiber does not count at all. Mm -hmm. If it is soluble fiber, it absolutely counts. It mm -hmm. can be up to two to three calories of sugar per gram of food. Uh, soluble corn fiber, mm -hmm. oat fiber, tapioca mm -hmm. fiber, all these fibers, it says, it says fiber, it's fine. Right. But the, no. other, the other thing is, that some of these things get called a fiber, but they're not really a fiber. Now, some of them are fibers, but there's a very gray area on food labels. Yes. So, and so if they're using any corn, oat, tapioca uh, fiber, you're getting some sugar calories from that. Yes, you are. I don't care if they act like you're not. You are. And I just saw a tweet today from a guy. He, he ate one of the... Uh, some kind of chocolate keto treat and on his CGM had a huge blood sugar spike. Well, that wasn't, I wasn't telling you that story today, but that's what happens to me. A bar from a company that I will not currently name, but I have named in other places. So you can Just do your research. It, Chalk zero. Chalk zero. That's who um, it was. Yeah, yes. yeah. My blood sugar went up more. Yeah. On they use soluble zero, corn fiber. Right. Which is sugar. It's corn. I fruit those corn syrup. It went up more than I ate a regular chocolate bar, like a normal, non-keto chocolate yes. bar. My blood sugar went up less than of, the chalk zero. One of the reasons we say that if it says keto on the label, it probably is definitely ain't keto. Yeah. Yeah. So Keto's real food. Learn there might be certain types of foods, right? They've done these studies. Like some people are like, I eat a banana. My blood sugar doesn't go up at all, but I eat hummus and it does. They've actually found these studies. There's some weird yep. personal variability. If you know exactly 
what works for you, then eat that way through experimentation. But if you're trusting some numbers on papers and labels, use total carbs. Yes, 100%. Yeah, totally absolutely. All right. Thanks well, so much for having me. Thank you for coming on. What a pleasure. I am in your house, though, so I couldn't. He you kind of owe me. Right, yeah. right. And everyone, the dog is just barking because it's a dog. Yep, it's, it's a, a dog. It's a puppy. Yeah. So there's nothing wrong. We're all safe. All right. Good night, everybody. Bye-bye. Thank you so much for joining us for this episode of Keto Life Support. Want more information? Want show notes? Want to suggest a topic? Just head over to ketolifesupport.com. That's where all that kind of thing can go on. By the way, I have a request. If you could go to your podcast host and hit subscribe, we would really, really appreciate it. And what would be even more awesome is if you could write a review. And what would be even more awesome than that is if you could write like a really flattering review. Just asking, you know, you do you. All right. So thanks so much for joining us. I'm thrilled that you're part of the keto fam.